Yeah, welcome. Hello, my name's Oliver. Uh, so I'm studio director for a new studio in Leamington called Lockwood Leamington. Uh, recently founded to help set it up and develop content for Abakin, but I'm here to talk about augmented reality and our recent development experiences with it. I think Phil made a very exciting point about two billion daily active users within five years. I would agree with that and I agree with a lot of what he says. Um, I'm not going to be repeating, hopefully, I'm not what, what he said, but uh, sharing some different insights. Uh, a little bit of background about Lockwood. So we're the um, developer of the mobile hit title, Avakin Life, uh, which is a huge online community with personal customization at its heart. Uh, Avakin recently sailed past 35 million downloads. You can't see it too well on there, but maybe on the other screen. Sees around 500,000 daily active users and is generating over a million dollars a month and all those figures are heading north. Um, we're hiring. Um, there's a range of positions opened in Nottingham in Leamington. I uh, offer a very generous quarterly profit share. Uh, David Helgerson, founder of Unity, recently joined the board. So it's a very exciting time for us. Uh, we're going places and if you're interested in a role with us, give us a shout. So our agenda, um, talked about who we are. Maybe talking about augmented reality, uh, but I want to talk about what it is fundamentally, not just what the hardware is, not just what the potential is, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but fundamentally what it is, so we have a better idea of what we should be developing for it. Uh, show some platforms and opportunities, some example products, um, and then throughout the presentation you'll see this short URL in the top right. If you note that down, all the materials I've referred to within this talk you can find in that link. Okay, so let's get going. If we understand some of the fundamentals of human perception, we can appreciate that AR has been with us for a very long time. So this image depicts uh, a milestone, a recreation of a milestone on the Appian Way just outside of Rome. At the time, its main purpose was to denote the travelers one mile from Rome. Now this abstracted idea was one of the methods the Romans used to impress upon conquered peoples their will and organize their reality. So if we skip forward to today, we have created a range of intersubjective ideas that define our reality and how it's organized. And that's a couple of long words there, but I'm going to go into detail and explain exactly what I mean by that. So we take the road signs, for example. There's a lot of information here that we as homo sapiens are mostly able to deal with. So what I'm trying to get across is that augmented reality isn't necessarily an idea that's new to our minds. It's something that we're very familiar with. What we're talking about is digitalizing uh, our augmented realities. So just explain that a little bit. So humans have some profound abilities. Uh, like our close relative, the chimpanzee, we can be objective, which is to say that we can recognize a banana or an apple and be able to tell the difference between them. But we can also be subjective about things, which means that something that depends on the mind or on an individual's perception for its existence. So over a relatively short amount of time, our subjective ability has extended far beyond animals into an incredible depth and appreciation for art, music, and creativity, uh, play, essentially. And then there is intersubjectivity. Now this is the profound difference between us and animals. This is our unique human ability to create something and share it between conscious minds as if it's real. So let me say that again. This is something that isn't real. We're capable of thinking that it is real. For example, money. This is an idea that isn't real, it's barely tangible, and yet it has become crucial, it's become a crucial part of all our societies. Without a doubt, money affects every part of our reality from whether we can eat, stay healthy, or stay on good terms with one another. When people are offered bitcoins instead of money, a common response is, no thanks, I'll stick with real money. Many believe in one more than the other, to the degree where one is seen to be real and one isn't, even though really, neither of them are real. As humans, if we can create the dollar and believe it's real and imbue it with so much power, what other realities might we create? So skip forward to what's coming next. This is an image, this is a still image from um, NVIDIA augmented reality demonstration from CES earlier this month. And it shows a display denoting where vehicles are and where they all are in, in real time, what they are and where they are all in real time. 
and it offers a small glimpse into how we'll perceive the world in the not too distant future. And we're going to see some fundamental changes in how we perceive the world and interact with each other. It also allows us to ask some interesting questions. For example, as AR becomes broadly available, which uh, if you saw Phil's talk, it, it, no doubt it's, it's happening, it will happen, uh, vehicles will begin to drive themselves. Will we need street signs? Or will they gradually disappear over the next 50 years like that milestone on the Appian Way? It'll only be recreated in some data in a virtual world in some way. So if you imagine going out on the streets of London later and imagining there are no street signs, that's the kind of world we could be moving into. So what's the current state of the art in terms of technology and how are they applicable? So here are just a few of the burgeoning array of AR platforms and being here at Pocket Gamer, I'm sure you're already well aware with, of many of them. Uh, Microsoft have stolen the lead with HoloLens, uh, which is an impressive device with a range of powerful sensors. And if you haven't tried it already, I compel you to, to find someone or find somewhere where you can try it because it gives you an idea of what future is coming. Google is fast catching up with AR with uh, AR Core which is their version of ARKit on mobile, and they're also a major investor in Magic Leap, which is kind of a HoloLens equivalent, but the next stage on in terms of its functionality and capabilities. Apple have made a very interesting move, not only with ARKit, by putting a depth sensing camera on the user-facing side, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Part of the reason for all these platforms and part of the reason why all these billions, literally billions of dollars are being invested in this is that it's easy to recognize how AR will be useful across a broad range of industries. A few examples, in the sciences, we can visualize the microscopic and the macroscopic right in front of us. We can test physics, we can visualize data. In medicine, surgeons are prepared for theater with a constant supply of cadavers, which are very difficult to get hold of and work with otherwise. Uh, marketing and entertainment, of course, includes games, what we'd potentially be most interested in. But it's for us as developers, our skills will become more and more in demand across a range of industries. So the future for us is looking very, very bright. I'm just going to skip through to opportunities, uh, see if we can take a, a shot at forecasting uh, where these opportunities might lie. But as with any data, uh, the statistics and statistics and then there's lies. So we have to take a lot of this with uh, a pinch of salt, but it should give us some idea of where we can come up with the ideas that we could find our traction, where we could find our audiences. <coughs> Just over a year ago, this was a forecast for devices that would be in use over, uh, say, 10 years, nine, nine or so years. And it shows just under 100 million devices in 2018, and yet reaches around 1,200 million devices in just nine years' time. So you can imagine pretty much everyone everywhere will have some idea of what AR is and how to use it and what they're using it for. If we take a look at artillery's intelligence, they have pointed out that thanks to ARKit, the number of AR-enabled devices has literally exploded overnight with lots of room still to grow. So this, this chart only includes iOS, not Android. Now, if we lay this information over the predicted number of devices, we see that we have a huge number of devices that we can target right now. Now, personally, and from talking with various people around the show today, uh, it's not seen that this is the opportunity, the market opportunity right now. What this is, is the dev kit phase. Now, if you ever work with consoles, you'll be used to the idea that you'll get a, a dev kit from a Sony or Microsoft, and then you'll work with that before the hardware really arrives so that you know how to produce applications or games for it before you're ready to go to market. And I think we're in the similar sort of stage here. Slightly different in that we're focusing on B2B, but the consumer market is approaching, it's approaching quite rapidly. So what we have here with our phones, AR Kit and AR Core, is an ability to start developing applications now for when the lightweight glasses arrive. So DigiCapital have been sharing their forecasts on the size of the AR industry up to 2021, and it shows near exponential growth over the next couple of years. So this is their most recent forecast. Uh, I did ask permission to share these. And they're pointing out that the mobile AR is, well, it's not on there, but it's sort of suggesting somewhere around 100 billion. Uh, that's what the industry is worth. Now, some may say that's over, some may say that's under. I think it's roughly in the ballpark myself. I think that's what I would expect to see. But it's interesting that you're only going to see the smart glasses taking up a small percentage of that at that time. So 
It means we have time, basically. Um, yeah, so it's not the time to make AR apps and expect returns. It's the time to patiently and carefully work out the technology and how to make great game experiences. If we do that, when the time is right, it will be like our success came out of nowhere. Much like when the iPhone launched in 2008, within two years it had completely destroyed the mid-market of console development and uh, created a whole range of new studios and opportunities that sprung up very, very quickly. People had been investing in that and developing those ideas for years before it actually happened. We should be taking the same preparations now. So I want to talk a little bit about development now. We've developed a few apps ourselves. I'll show a video in a few moments of what we've been creating. Uh, but I just want to share some insights if you're looking at developing applications on what you should be looking to do. To be an effective AR experience, it has to be in 3D, and yet it has to be mobile and untethered. I think one of the problems that VR suffered from is that you're tethered onto heavy hardware that people don't particularly want to wear, and it's quite isolating. AR doesn't have those problems because it's already on a product like the, uh, not really a consumer product, but a product like the HoloLens, which is mobile and untethered. Um, so as HoloLens development has shown, it requires developing with a smartphone benchmark within mind, because essentially that's what it is. It's a Windows phone tied to your face. Again, if we see the smartphone as the dev kit, we can start to work out what kind of applications we should be developing and in what way. If it runs well on a smartphone, it will certainly run well on future AR platforms. So we aim for around 100 to 150 draw calls and to batch as much as possible. So meshes are kept together, textures are atlased uh, onto as few sheets as possible, and sound is kept within a tight memory footprint. We try and keep the, the download size low. Does that mean that fidelity suffers? Not necessarily. If you understand the fundamentals of how to put these applications together, you see some really high quality applications on mobile right now, such as CSR2, for example. They are not limited in terms of fidelity by the performance of the hardware. Above all, these games should be designed from the ground up to play to AR strengths and avoid its weaknesses. So scale is a unique challenge in AR. Now, when you put meshes directly into uh, Unity and then put it onto ARKit, you'll find that everything is at a gigantic size. It's a very common issue, and um, there is um, a blog that Unity so let me go back one. Oh, OK, missing slide there. Um, but there is a blog on the URL that I have um, posted up there that um, shows uh, a link to that blog. And you can learn the specifics of what you should be doing with the camera, what you should be doing with meshes to make sure that it works uh, at runtime. But it's, uh, everyone's had this problem, so you won't be alone. Uh, and that also affects scale. We were working with a mini golf game, which again, I'll show you in a moment. We had a lot of issues actually getting the scale to work um, in conjunction with the physics. It broke a lot of things, but it can be addressed. It's a challenge, but it can be addressed. Hopefully this will be in the video. Expand.
So there's just a few of applications that we've created. That last one there, we literally put together in a couple of weeks just to see what other publishers and developers would think of it. Uh, right now, if you're looking to generate business, the way to do it is business to business. And I think um, this year we'll see a lot of applications, a lot of companies finding their feet in um, AR through business to business. And I think that's, that's the way it's going to grow. It won't be straight to consumer, it'll be through business first. Hmm, my slides are the wrong way around. Bear with me a second. But where is the killer app? Um, I love HoloLens. It's a fantastic piece of kit that has some great depth sensing abilities, but then Apple comes along and puts their depth sensor on the wrong side. It's supposed to be facing the world, but their camera is facing you, the user. Instead of augmenting the environment, they're, they're augmenting us, which is an interesting way of looking at it. And clearly it's not an accident. And I think they, along with Facebook, are really onto something here. What many devs have found hard to appreciate is that users love this feature. The Animoji may look quaint and uh, quirky, but actually it's fine to momentum. A lot of people are using it. They're really into it. And perhaps the killer app could be somewhere in there. Bear with me. So this chap, Corey Strasberger, has taken the iPhone 10 and built a real-time face rig that shows off the poten potential of the tech. Um, as developers, when we initially moved to mobile, we tried to bring FPS and racing games directly across because that's how they worked on consoles. However, landmark games like CSR showed us what kind of compelling experience would work, would work effectively on mobile. With AR, we must think creatively in order to, to develop the brand new compelling experiences that will only be possible in AR. Before we end, I'd like to share an idea of where this technology could be heading based on technologies that are available right now. And I'm using buzzwords here, I'm following articles that are online, but this is all technology that is available right now. It's rough, it's not ready for consumer use, but it is available. So AR is applicable to lots of genres. I'm going to pick out the racing genre here. So if we compare Forza to CSR, they both have huge appeal with very similar demographics. However, the gameplay experiences are radically different. Forza works really well with pads, and CSR works really well with touch to create a compelling capitalist experience. As we examine AR, we should consider what new compelling experiences we could produce. So here's my finger in the air proposal. It's called F1 Constructors Championship. Uh, let's pretend that the market timing is right, the due diligence has been performed, and the audience is ready. This is an example of what we could produce based on technology that already exists. It's rough, it's not ready, but it does exist. So imagine you can see your very own F1 racing car in front of you. You can walk around and admire its beauty uh, as if it's here with you in the same room. But then you could explode the vehicle and examine its components. Lots of interesting information is available on how each part works in relation to the whole vehicle. Your challenge is to make the, the interesting decisions that modify all these components, leading to a better racing car than all the other teams. Being in AR, you can invite your friends to join your team uh, and play with them wherever they are as if they are really with you. Some of the amazing tech that you could use includes a range of high fidelity gestures. I mean, really, one-to-one -one movement. Microsoft has announced a holographic processing unit is designed to recognize complex gestures and process them in real time. That's coming for the HoloLens 2, which many suggest will be around in 2019. When you reach out and touch a vehicle component, imagine you could actually feel it's there. At this year's CES, Meta, Ultra Haptics, and ZeroLight lit up the show with a demonstration of their haptic feedback system. One of the most wonderful aspects of AR is real-time collaboration in a virtual space. Platforms such as Azure Cloud Computing and Spatial OS can offer us powerful collaborative services to play with. By ensuring that each node passes data to and from each other, we can create learning networks. With the assets networked, players could use a generative design AI to come up with a choice of options for improved vehicle components. Imagine working with an AI and paying it to take your chassis and design an improved version. This is exactly what Autodesk have already achieved with their generative design AI. So this is something that they've already done. This is already happening. And interestingly, this is how we're going to work in the future as well. 
With something like blockchain, we can securely own our own design at a relatively low cost and easily transfer our design between games and platforms. This is just a start. I'm sure others will come up with far more compelling experiences. What could they be? So, just like to summarize, right now, 3D mobile is the key to AR. If we want to get into it, that's where we need to be looking. AR is the key to creating compelling applications with industry 4.0 technologies, such as nanotech, uh, AI, blockchain, etc. And this tech is the key to empowerment for all of us, wherever we are in the world. And that is where the future's heading. Thank you very much for listening. Much appreciated.